Hi, it's Lucy, and today we're here to do my Crooked Kingdom reading vlog. I originally filmed this as part of the Six of Crows reading vlog, but I realized I talked too long, so the Six of Crows reading vlog is a separate video, and this is a separate video, and I wanted to do this intro because it kind of starts in the middle of things, but without further ado, let's get into the video and check out the Six of Crows vlog if you haven't. I'm on part three of Crooked Kingdom, like a quarter through, I think. And I'm about to go to bed, which is why my scarf is on. But I wanted to update, tell you all what's happening, how I'm feeling. I'm going with the fact that everyone loves Matthias because basically the whole book is spent with him and Nina flirting, which is cute. You know, if I didn't remember what happened in Six of Crows, I would be a little more lenient toward Matthias. But yes, so far in Crooked Kingdom, as we know, at the end of Six of Crows, Inej was captured, kidnapped. She was being held hostage by Van Eck, and so they're trying to figure out how to get Inej back. And so that's what we've spent this entire time doing. And also, side plot, Jasper's dad comes from Novi Zem from their farm because his loan was called in, which they figure out was clearly a plot to get Jasper basically, but his dad is really there. I don't know, Jasper's situation is somehow the saddest to me, even though it's not the saddest. Like, Inej was literally kidnapped. Nina was also kidnapped. <laughs> Wyland was basically disowned by his father. Kaz's parents are dead and his only sibling died in a horrific way that traumatized him. And Matthias was, you know, radicalized basically because his entire family was killed. And, but he was also in the military, so killing other people isn't, not that it's not a big deal, but I don't know, for some reason I feel the graveness, these characters killing other people, more but also less like it feels like less because it happens so quickly and it's so common but i feel it a little more especially in jesper's case because i don't know he's like the most normal one of them all if that makes sense i guess the situation feels like the most his fault even though we're being shown his like gambling addiction so it's not exactly his fault but i'm not saying addicts are at fault for their addiction so yeah his situation just makes me really sad we see his dad and his dad loves him and that also makes me really sad to seeing the situation that they're in and so that was a little side plot the other side plot is nina's withdrawal from the dreader perem and we're seeing all that happens with that and the way her powers have started to change already she says it feels different and she's still like is clearly that addicted to the Jurda, it only takes one. They go through the plot to save Inej and they end up like figuring out what Van X plot was basically and they end up kidnapping Van X new wife slash Wyland's stepmother <laughs> and tricking Van Eck into thinking that they were coming to the location that Inej was but instead they kidnap Van X wife. Prior to that Inej is having doubts about being saved and Van Eck almost breaks her legs. That scene is so traumatizing. I remember it from the first time I read it and I was like, oh my god. Like I was like, oh my god, is, she, is that gonna happen? And it didn't happen, thank god, but it's so traumatizing and this man is horrible. Absolutely horrible. I did not, I, I knew he was horrible, but like how bad can you get really? Um, but he is horrible, doesn't like his son because he has a learning disability <laughs> and like I just, I don't know, I can't imagine. I mean, I know other, like in real life, People treat their children badly for various reasons, but it just seems like so ridiculous. So it culminates in them doing a trade where they trade in Van Eck's wife for Inej. They go to a meeting spot to do it, and then they do the trade, and Van Eck is like, oh my god, they stole my son too. And since Wylan has the face of Kuei now, he's nowhere to be found. They couldn't produce him if they had to because they can't fix him right now. And so the dot watch, the police show up because he's been kidnapped, allegedly. And so it ends up being a whole thing. And they were prepared, of course, because they're the crows and they have to be prepared for anything. But they were not prepared for someone else. Nina, Matthias, Wylan, and Jesper end up being chased by these metal winged people it's so weird and also i'm noticing how in both books a big not big bad but like random bad people have wings or not people because i guess the nijivoya and the shadow and bone trilogy aren't technically people but they have wings they fly are scary and weird i guess scary, wings make things scary and weird because these things are described as let's see a man with wings huge metallic things that moved in a hummingbird were 
And so they appear to be shoe people with wings. I don't know what's going on there, but terrifying. So that's where I'm at right now. They're all fine. My cat's gonna try and get in through the room because I've been talking. So, hello, I'm here to admit I failed, but look at Tucker. So I don't know if that helps the situation at all. Yeah, so I did not complete the Six of Crows duology in 48 hours. It is currently 1.30 p.m. on Monday. So how many hours is that? 48 would have been at 11.30. So we're at 50 hours right now. I think I can do it in like maybe like 56. Definitely by the end of the day. I'm not gonna, what, redo the vlog because I failed? No, I'm almost done with the series. I'm a little over halfway through the book. I came on here solely to complain. <laughs> not complain. I am really enjoying it. I'm reliving all my feelings, I feel like. Originally when I read the duology, I gave Crooked Kingdom five stars and Six of Crows four stars. And I was trying to remember where the disparity is. And definitely the disparity comes from Crooked Kingdom just has so much more individual character development because they're focusing on like different trials and things. Uh, it leaves more room for Lee Bardugo to do more of the character development, which we do see some in Six of Crows, but it's just so much more. And we get Wyland's perspective in this, which I still don't know why she didn't include in the first book, I guess, so she could like leave the fact that he's Van Eck's son as a surprise. But yeah, his perspective is really, I feel like it adds value to this. And I'm just enjoying it so much. Speaking of Wylan and Jesper, we weren't speaking of them, but there was a cute little scene after they deal with everything with Van Eck the first time. Kaz has revealed his plot, his plan to basically bankrupt Van Eck by destroying the sugar in Van Eck's silos and then speculating on the sugar trade, I guess, basically, since he, Van Eck apparently owns a third of the sugar in existence currently. <laughs> Uh, if they destroy his sugar, then the price of sugar will go up because that's how stocks work, how trade works. Commodity. Yes, commodity trading. That, <laughs> That is what it's called. That's how commodity trading works. And so they have like three separate plans. Nina wants to get the Grisha and the city out of the city because there's a whole thing where the Grisha are being kidnapped, likely so that they can be given Jirda Perem and be used as like soldiers. So they are also dealing with that. So in the end, Nina and Inej go to the silos to destroy the sugar. Wylan and Kaz end up going to Van Eck's house to steal his seal from a safe that Van Eck keeps so that they can forge papers for the Grisha in the city to get them out of the city and they need his seal because they're planning to use one of his ships which is part of their big plot. Jesper and Kuei and Matthias stay home. I don't think they had a plan. I think they were just staying home. And in the midst of them planning this, Wylan, his invention to destroy the sugar is called a weevil, which I've never heard of. But then, cute little moment, Jesper's like, oh, I want to call it Wyville, like weevil, but spelled with W-Y-V-I-L for Wylan. <laughs> And Wyland says it's terrible. And then Jesper says, it's brilliant, just like you. And so cute, I love it. Before they do that trip, Jesper and Wyland end up going on their own little trip for supplies, but also so that Wyland can visit his mom's grave. But when they get there, they find out that his mom is actually not dead and that Van Eck had her basically committed for insanity, uh, like people used to do in the olden times when they got tired of their wives. So having escaped, that kind of affects them in here. So he finds her there in the asylum, but since Wylan looks like Kauai because of the tailoring, uh, his mom doesn't recognize him, but they see her paintings, which are all basically paintings of Wylan, which is so sad. Also back to emotions for all those Kaz and Inez shippers out there. There was a nice scene with them where Inez tells Kaz that Van Eck planned to break her legs. She says, would you have come for me then Kaz when I couldn't scale a wall or walk a tightrope when I wasn't the race anymore? And Kaz responds, I would come for you. I would come for you, and if I couldn't walk, I'd crawl to you. And no matter how broken we were, we'd fight our way out together. Knives drawn, pistols blazing, because that's what we do. We never stop fighting. So, we love a good romantic moment. And we also get some cute little moments with Matthias and Nina. And I can kind of see how people ship them in this book, because all of his horrible moments, really, or the majority of his horrible moments, are in the first book. So if you're reading the second book, you kind of forget about him being so horrible and like, yeah, he learns. But even in this book, we do see some cultural 
clashes and things like that. And Nina's like, he has like moved his mind around for me, but he's thought of Ravka and Grisha as the enemy so long, it's gonna take time for him to see the rest of my people in a proper light. So then comes the heist or the second heist or second, is it a heist? Second job, that's what they call it. Nina and Inej go to the sugar silos Wylan and Kaz end up going to Van Eck's house to steal a seal, and Jesper and Matthias and Kuei are at home. Inej climbs the silos, gets in them, starts pouring the weevil in to destroy the sugar, but then she is ambushed by some other girl who's supposed to be like her counterpart, basically. Also, I forgot, we had a little cameo of Tamar and Zoya from, you know, the Shadow and Bone trilogy, which I appreciated when Nina was going to the Grisha to tell them to get out of the city because they were there for diplomatic reasons, I don't know. But it was nice seeing them. So yes, Inej is ambushed by someone who's supposed to be like similar to her and also is like a spider, which is what they call people who do like quiet spying or whatever. I just wanted to point out that this woman, uh, I mean, seems not okay. She's like, I will be rewarded in my next life for all the people I will kill is what she says basically. And I'm like, very few religions even in this fictional world, believe that. Like, even the Furidans think that the Grisha are not human. So, very odd, weird way to look at things, to be like, God wants me to kill people. So, just wanted to point that out. But we find out that Pekka Rollins paid her to come after her. Nina is dealing with the Dime Lions, another gang, and she fully sees her new power because after the Jota Param, her power has changed and now she controls the dead instead of the living. And she raised a zombie army, basically, from the ship of dead people, which was passing by for some reason. So she can do that now. And then while Kaz and Wylan are breaking into Van X safe, we get to see Kaz actually being nice for once. Wylan is saying, how would I run an empire? I can't read a ledger or a bill of lading. I can't write a purchase order. My father is wrong about a lot of things, but he's right about that. I'd be a laughing stock. And Kaz tells him a story, I guess, I don't know. And he says, when people see someone walking down the street, leaning on his cane, what do they feel? Wylan looked away. People always did when Kaz talked about his limp, as if he didn't know what he was or how the world saw him. They feel pity. Now what do they think when they see me coming? And then Wylan's mouth quirked up at the corner. They think they'd better cross the street. Kaz says, you're not weak because you can't read. You're weak because you're afraid of people seeing your weakness. You're letting shame decide who you are. And then he says, think on it, Wylan. It's shame that lines my pockets. Shame that keeps the barrel teeming with fools ready to put on a mask just so they can have what they want with no one the wiser for it. We can endure all kinds of pain. It's shame that eats men whole. That was a really nice quote. But unfortunately, that is when they get caught by Pekka Rollins. They do a whole scheme. Pekka Rollins basically talks about stuff that it doesn't matter, but they end up burning a hole through the floor and rolling onto Van Eck's dinner table because they were going during a fancy dinner because they knew other people would be distracted. And they basically roll out and go through that. Also in the meantime, Jesper, Matthias, and Kuei are also fighting off a different set of dime lions. And basically Matthias is like the head of this tiny Grisha army, as Jesper re remarks, and they are able to escape. It would be a fun fight scene if they weren't fighting for their lives and they all meet up at the hotel where Jesper's dad is staying. And during this fight, Matthias also has some kind of revelation where he's like, Grisha could also be like the work of Jell, which is his god, tree god, I think it's supposed to be. And he thinks on what Nina had said about the ice court when they were at the ice court. Nina remarked that all of the architecture seemed to be Grisha born. And he starts thinking, what if Joe worked through the Grisha? And he thinks, what if fear or anger isn't what drives the Dr Druskel? but simply envy. What did it mean to aspire to serve Jell, only to see his powers in the gifts of another, to know you could never possess these gifts yourself? And he starts thinking if the Druskel gave their oath to Firda, but to their god as well, if they could be made to see miracles where once they'd seen abomination, what else might change? What if Jell's hand had raised the waters the night of the wrathful storm that wrecked the Druskel and bound Matthias and Nina together? So we see him changing. 
in the present time or where I'm at in the book. They're all in the hotel. They're trying to figure out what to do. Kaz and Jesper have a fight because Jesper wants Kaz to forgive him or stop punishing him because Jesper did reveal that they were leaving town in the first book by accident and also... Hi, hello. My camera died in the middle of me talking in the last clip. So we're gonna pick up where I left off. I have since finished the book. It took a little bit more than 48 hours. So in a 48-ish hours, it was, it was like what I said. I think it ended up being 52 or 56. Anyway, who cares? Let's just talk about the book, huh? Once again, I wanted everyone to see my eyeshadow look, but I have to put my glasses back on because I can't see. Like I was saying, Kaz and Jasper were in the middle of having a fight. They had like a physical fight where they were rolling around and everything, but then Jasper's dad comes back up. He was in a different room and he's like, what the heck is going on? And then he's like, Jasper, we need to speak immediately uh, in a very dadly voice. And then for some reason, him speaking makes Kaz come up with an idea. And his idea is basically that they're going to stage an auction for Kuwait's indenture basically because of the laws of Kerch of Ketterdam you can do that you can auction off your you which is a uh, very interesting we can talk about those implications later but before that Jesper goes to talk to his dad they have a sort of heart to heart but it ends up with Jesper being mad at his dad because his dad had always wanted him to hide his Grisha abilities because of what happened to his mom which wasn't anything like, obviously it was horrible that his mother died, but it wasn't like she was hunted down. His mom passed away after she healed someone else, and she, during the healing, she, like, took on too much of the illness that the sick person had, so she ended up getting sick. But his dad kind of blamed her being a Grisha, and he was like, if she wasn't a Grisha, like, she wouldn't have been called to do that. So he encouraged Jesper really to hide his abilities. There's a scene in here where after his mother died, the girl who his mother had ended up saving turned out to be a Grisha. And that girl's father ends up coming to visit Jesper and his dad and is like, our daughter is a Grisha. We know that Jesper probably is. There are teachers, we're going to send her to go learn. Uh, you should send Jesper. And his dad gets very angry and is like, Jesper's not a Grisha or Zoa, I think is what it's called in Zemeni. This language thing, I feel like the language, when books have multiple languages, it doesn't work as well when you interchange them in that way. Like the whole thing is in English and then it's just like, oh, this one Zemeni word. And they seem to translate for each other or for us, I guess, really, but if you were speaking in two languages that the other person knew, you wouldn't say the same thing twice in a different language. So it's clearly just for us, but I think that's kind of weird. For example, Jesper says, this is throughout the book, but it's just something I noticed here. Jesper says, am I Zoa? Am I Grisha? Why would you say that? But anyway, this is a heartfelt moment. So Jesper's dad says, that's what killed your mother. Do you understand? That's what took her from us. I won't let it take you too. And then his shoulders slumped and he asked Jesper, do you want to go with them? You can go if that's what you want. I won't be mad. But obviously Jesper is 10 and he, it says he thought of his father alone on the farm, coming home to an empty house every day. And so he just said he didn't want to go. Obviously a 10 year old is not gonna, like you feel the weight of like leaving your father alone forever or not forever, but you know, alone after you both just lost your mom, like, you're not gonna leave. So we get more of Jesper's backstory. And then after this conversation, fight kind of thing with his dad, it's not really a fight, it's, it's I guess argument. Jesper comes out and sees Wylan at the piano, playing the piano, or who he thinks is Wylan, because they have a conversation and Jesper and Wylan kiss. And I remember first reading this, I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And then the end of the chapter, the real Wylan comes up in the door frame, sees them kiss, and Jesper realizes that wasn't Wyland, and it was Kauai at the piano. And remember, Wyland looks like Kauai because of the tailoring. Jesper kissed the wrong person, but also Kauai let him. Kauai obviously knows he's not Wyland. And it's kind of funny, but also technically, you know, assault. Jesper says, you should have said something. And Kauai shrugged and goes, you were very brave on Black Veil, since we're all probably going to die. And then he's like, you're a very good kisser. And there's like later chapters where it's mentioned how basically Kauai spends a lot of his time drawing Jesper and has, I guess, a huge crush on him. It's kind of funny, but also kind of weird. And I am going to sue Lee Bardugo for taking that first kiss away from me because I know technically it wasn't Wyland, but I was, I remember. This was literally two years ago and it still plagues me how excited I was for that kiss. And it was not 
the right kiss. So I'm suing Lee Bardugo. It took two years, but I'm suing her because she was wrong for that, okay? Absolutely wrong for that. Back to the auction though, they're going to auction off Kauai. The government has to let him do it because you're allowed to do that in Kerch apparently because of Gizon, the god of industry and commerce. Kaz thinks this is a perfect plan because since trade is so powerfully protected in Kerch, everyone has to actually go out of their way to protect him because nobody else can have him until he sells off his indenture and the bidding is closed. The one issue is that Kaz's plan is to have Ravka bid on Kuei and win the auction so that Kuei can have his wish of living in Ravka and sipping tea. But there's one problem because Ravka has empty coffers. They don't have any money. They've been borrowing money from Kirsch since the second civil war, so they don't have any money. But Kaz has an answer to that problem as well. He plans to get the merchant council to put money into a Jurda farm and funnel that money to Ravka so that Ravka will have the funds needed to purchase Kuei. So Kaz wants Jesper's dad to pretend, I mean, he is a Jurda farmer, that's what he is, but to pretend to represent a consortium of Jurda farmers looking for investors. They are successful. They pique Vanek's interest. Vanek tries to bargain with Pom Fahey, which is Jesper's dad. Uh, they do a roundabout way of reverse psychology by like pretending they don't want Vanek to be in the consortium, but that makes Vanek want to be in the consortium more. And really, it's a great thing to watch. Nina's there and she does a little spell of making Vanek feel a little bit guilty for trying to kill your son. I think I skipped talking about this, but basically how Wyland ended up in the barrel with the dregs, his dad lied to him and told him that he was sending him away to music school in a different city. And Wyland believed him and he was like, I'm a failure, I can't read, so that makes me a failure, which it's still just so baffling to me that your kid can't read so you don't love him anymore. Like what? Anyway. But yes, he tells Wyland that he's going to send him to a school in a different city. So Wyland goes with two people that he thinks his dad like hired to like escort him. But really he hired them to kill Wyland. And so Wyland ends up getting away. He jumps off the boat and he ends up in the barrel because he doesn't know where to go because he can't go back home because his dad just tried to kill him. And while he's in the barrel, he needs money, obviously. He has like a week's worth of money, I think he says, and he ends up getting a job at a dye facility, I think. And while he's there, he makes the whole factory process better and better. And the head person keeps asking him for advice before Jesper finds him because Cass sent him because he found out that a merchant's son was in the barrel. And that is the start of their beautiful friendship more than friendship. Kaz also heads back to the Crow Club because now per Haskell is kind of retaken over the dregs. And so Kaz is gonna go to get it back. And he does, he gets uh, very injured. Like three people beat him up, but he survives. And then he beats them back up and he gives a rousing speech to the rest of the people. And they all decide to continue following him. So now he's got his gang back. And the next day they go to meet the Grisha congregation, which consists of Zoya, Genya and Stormhund. Kaz and Stormhund go and talk on their own. Wyland ends up asking Genya to tailor him back to what he's supposed to look like. Genya successfully does it. They have a nice conversation. Afterwards, Wyland looks normal and he and Jesper have another heart to heart and it's very nice. Wyland starts questioning, not questioning, but discussing Jesper's Grisha powers with him. And he says, has it ever occurred to you that your Grisha ability might be part of the reason you're such a good shot. What if you don't miss because you're directing your bullets too? And then they have a really nice moment. Jesper says, why do you have to say things like that? Why can't you just let things be easy? And Wyland says, because they're not easy, you keep pretending everything is okay. You move on to the next fight or the next party. What are you afraid is going to happen if you stop? And then Jesper's kind of getting restless and Wyland says stop. And then they have a beautiful kiss and they're the ship in my heart. There's also a little note about Kaz's limp and how Genya tailored Kaz as well as Wyland, but she didn't tailor as much of Kaz. And Nina asks why she could have, and Kaz says she didn't know when to stop. Nina had a sudden suspicion that Genya had offered to heal Kaz's bad leg. And I kind of like that. There's this whole thing about disability often being healed magically in fantasy stories. And I appreciated that Lee Bardugo didn't go that route, it's likely because this aspect of the story is own voices because Lee Bardugo does use a cane. So now it is time for the day, the day of the auction. First, we have a tragedy. Wyland ends up captured by two gang members and they beat him up. 
so that he will reveal their whole plan to Van Eck. Who is his dad, remember that? A man who almost killed his son twice now? Wild. Meanwhile, the actual auction is happening. The bidding starts, all of the various countries are there. Fjorda, Ravka, the Shu, the Kurt are bidding I think as well. And the Kalish, the Kalish? I would like to know more about them. I don't think we ever will, but I would like to know more because I think they're supposed to be like the Suli, which is Inej's ethnicity. The Suli are a traveling people. They seem to mostly be in Ravka, but they're not exactly Ravkin, I guess. I'm not sure. But the Kalish, we only just hear various things. Nina keeps pretending to be Kalish. Obviously, it sounds like it's supposed to be like Scottish or Irish, but when you look at the map, there's nowhere that says like Kale. I don't know what the country would be called, but I don't know where they're from because we don't we don't meet any characters who are Kalish. We mostly just see people pretending to be Kalish, actually. So yeah, but they have a delegation there. Sorry, that was a tangent. And they all start bidding. All the bidding is happening until the Council of Tides show up. The Council of Tides are a group of Grisha. I think they're all supposed to be tide makers and they are like the Grisha like component of the government, I guess. They represent, I don't know what they're supposed to represent, but honestly, they seem to be, have more power. It's mentioned earlier in the book that they like grounded some ships because they moved the ocean away. So they seem to have a lot of more than governmental power because they can just move the water, I guess. I don't know, but they are part of the government sort of kind of. Anyway, the Council of Tide show up and they are like, this auction is a sham. They say it that way. The Tide Makers say, that the money was being funneled to the shoe, not the Ravkins. And they also say it was done through a false fund created by Johannes Rietveld and Jan Van Eck. Jan Van Eck is our evil villain. Johannes Rietveld is the alias that they gave to Jesper's dad. While all this arguing is happening, Inej is fighting with her shadow, the girl I mentioned who stopped her on the sugar silos. And they have a really kind of epic fight. I kind of feel like Danyasha was added for no reason. Like it was just so they could have those two fight scenes, I feel like. I don't know, I just didn't feel like her character really added anything other than to just be like Inez's equal or something. But she could have fought anyone else. I don't know, I didn't really think her character was necessary at all because she's in two fights and then she dies. Yes, Inez kills her. She falls off the roof, so it's not really killed her but you know she's dead now so and also at the same time nina is spreading the plague now that she realizes she can raise dead matter dead bodies dead anything part of their plan was for her to use basically dead cells and spread them among people so it looked like they were like de decaying and then everyone thought they had the plague and because this is an island country they are very susceptible to the plague and also uh, we are in COVID times right now, which is not the plague, but you know, pandemic. So hashtag relatable now, although COVID doesn't do what Nina did. It doesn't make you look like you're decaying. And also at the same time, this is very fast paced. So it's hard to describe because all these things are happening at the same time. But also at the same time, Jesper is doing some kind of plan so that he can meet Inej and get into place so that he can shoot Kuwe. But he is stopped because one of the ultra powerful metal shoe beings shows up. It apparently had been tracking him because uh, they can smell Grisha, which is one way. So they have this fight scene where Jesper ends up using the last of the weevil that Wylan invented and he forces it down the guy's throat or he like puts it in his mouth and it honestly sounds awful. If that makes it into whatever season of the show this will be in, uh, that show will be very dark. <laughs> but Jesper's running out of time after this and so he can't get into place. So he decides to take a chance, listen to what Wyland said and he try and use his Grisha power to direct a bullet. And he basically shoots around the corner and it actually works. He shoots Kuwe, which is part of their plan. It's a fake bullet and it just hits a pouch that was on Kuwe that contained like blood and other human organic matter. And Kaz catches him and shoots him with this drug that's supposed to slow down his heart rate so that it seems like he's dead. Matthias goes with a medic to get Kuwe help. It's more so that they can get Kuwe Bill Claire dead. And then Pekka Rollins shows up and Kaz says that he has basically gotten rid of Pekka Rollins' son. And Pekka Rollins is like, how did you even know I had a son? Well, you kept talking about leaving a legacy. And I was like, who is he leaving a legacy for? He basically tells Pekka Rollins that he has to remember what he did to Kaz and then he will free his son, basically. But Pekka Rollins can't remember. He's frantically trying to figure it out because he doesn't want his son to die. 
And Kaz is like, well, I buried him six feet under the ground. And he's like, you need to know my brother's name. Uh, but Pekka Rollins can't remember and he starts begging Kaz on his knees. And so Kaz tells him that he buried him under this place. And he's like, if you leave now, you should get there in plenty of time. And he leaves, he rushes away. And Inej is like, how could you do that? And Kaz is like, I've never seen that child in before in my entire life. So he made up the whole, not made up the whole thing, but he just took some educated guesses. He used a little stuffed lion to be like, oh, is this your child's toy? And he was like, I just guessed because, you know, he's part of a gang. We all have crow tattoos. He probably keeps lions all around his house. He said some random details about the kid and he was like, well, it was called the Kalish Prince. And I figured he probably named it after his son, a little redheaded boy because Kalish people are redheaded, I guess. I guess maybe Pekka Rollins is supposed to be Kalish? I don't know. He just bluffed the whole thing. Pekka Rollins' son was fine. Inej remarks, you showed mercy, Kaz. You were the better man. And he says, Inej, I could only kill Pekka's son once. He can imagine his death a thousand times. And then we flip to Matthias. Matthias helps get Kwe's body to the hospital, along with Nina, who's pretending to be a pregnant woman, and one of the other dregs who's not part of the Six of Crows gang. They get to the hospital, they get rid of the medic, and Nina and everyone are already inside. Matthias turns around and sees a young Druskal boy yelling at him. I charge you with treason, he said, voice breaking. High treason against Fjorda and your Druskal brothers. Matthias is unarmed. And the kid keeps going and says, you are a traitor to your land and your god. And Matthias continues to try and be friendly to him because he sees himself in him. He says, what's your name? The boy did not want to hurt anyone. And he tries once again to reason with him, come closer with him. The boy once again says, I charge you with treason. And Matthias says, I am guilty. I've done terrible things. And if you wish it, I will walk back to the church with you right now. I will face your friends and commanding officers and we can see what justice may come. And the boy says, you're lying. Do even let them kill that shoe boy you were supposed to protect. You're a traitor and a coward. And Matthias says, I will go with you. You have my word and you have the gun. There's nothing to fear from me. Do not be afraid. Fear is how they control you. And he thinks we'll find a way to change their minds. The boy had only been with the order for six months. He could be reached. There's so much in the world you don't have to be afraid of if you would only open your eyes. The boy says, I told you to stay where you are. Matthias says, you don't want to hurt me. I know, I was like you once. I am nothing like you, said the boy. Matthias saw the anger there, the rage. He knew it so well, but he was still surprised when he heard the shot. And then he somehow still has it in him to walk to where Nina was. And while this is happening, they're trying to revive Kauai because the drug that they were using, I guess was experimental. I didn't understand that. They were like, we're not sure if this will work, if he can actually live after this. But anyway, Zoya becomes a defibrillator. Defibrillator? Yeah, that's how you say it. Zoya becomes a defibrillator and uses lightning from her like squalor abilities to revive him. And after this, everyone starts to go their separate ways. Nina is one of the last people there and she sees Matthias walking down the street and Matthias comes up to her and kisses her and she's surprised because she's normally the one who kisses him first. And then she realizes that he has a bullet wound in his stomach. And Nina wants to take Parem to try and fix him again. And Nina says, I can fight it a second time. I can heal you and then I can fight it. And he says, it's not worth the risk. She says, it's worth every risk. And he says, I need you to save the others. He's dying. He has two dying wishes. He wants her to help try and save the other Druskel. He says, swear to me, you'll at least try to help them to make them see. And Nina still wants him to be alive and obviously she says we'll go together matthias we'll be spies genya will tailor us and we'll go to fyrda together i'll wear all the ugly knitted sweater vests you want and he says go home to ravka nina be free as you were meant to be be a warrior as you always have been just save some mercy for my people there has to be a fyrda worth saving i've been made to protect you even in death i will find a way and then he asks her to bury me so i can go to jail Bury me so I can take root and follow the water north. And she promises. And then he dies. And Nina almost tries to revive him. And Inej is like, you have to let him go. And it's very sad. Uh, honestly, when that happened the first time, I was a little shocked. I was still shocked. And then when King of Scars came out, I, I thought we were going to revive him. I knew it had been a while, but I was like, he can't be dead, dead. Lee Bardugo doesn't kill, kill people, does she? I was really shocked that that happened, honestly. But it makes sense. I think. And at least he went out with a good heart this time. And then we go back to Wylan and Jesper who are still at the Church of Barter, which is really what they call it. Uh, I know trade is very important to Kirch, but come on, Church of Barter? 
Van Eck is being accused of stealing from the council because they all put money into that fund that has now apparently been going to the shoe. Van Eck is trying to say that Brecker did it. It's all Brecker's work and they're like, okay, Van Eck, can you turn around so we can cuff your hands? They do not believe him. It is revealed that Wylan is still his heir and Van Eck says he wrote Wylan out as soon as Alice, his new wife, conceived. But Kaz is like, are you sure about that? And Wylan realizes that when they were in the safe, Kaz had left something behind and it was a forged will for Van Eck. And then Van Eck says, no, you can't give this Cretan control of my funds while gesturing to Wylan. And everyone on the council looks at him in shock because they're like, how could you say such a thing about your son? Uh, which at least some people have some brains here. Van Eck says, even if I'd wanted him to inherit, he's incompetent to do so. He can't read, can barely string a basic sentence together on the page. He is an idiot, soft-minded child. And once again, they're like, how can you say that? Van Eck laughed wildly. This at least I can prove. Give him something to read. Go on, Wylan. Show them what a great man of business you will make. And the guy who's arresting him is like, you don't have to do that. <laughs> Wylan's like, no, I'll do it. I'll oblige my father. In fact, if you have a transfer authority, I can sign it now and begin assembling funds for my father's defense. And Wyland had mentioned earlier, when he was younger, he hid the fact that he couldn't read for a while by memorizing the things that were read to him and putting it to music in his head. And while they were visiting his mother in the asylum, Jesper had read to him a transfer of authority thing. So he had remembered it and he basically read it from memory to prove that he could read. And then Van Eck continues to go rabid and is like, it's a trick, it's another one of Brecker's tricks. You'll destroy everything I've built, everything my father and his father built, you. And then Jesper whispers quietly so no one else can hear, I can read to him. He has a very soothing baritone, <laughs> added Wiley. And then Van Eck continues digging himself a grave. He says, you don't even know if that's really Wylan. He could be wearing another boy's face. Obviously everyone thinks that does not make any sense whatsoever. Genya and Nina on Perem are the only people who've ever come close to making people look wildly different. Most people, when they get tailored, they, it needs to be over a very long period of time to, for any significant change. And it's mostly like eye color and things like that. Like nothing that would make you look like in a completely different person. And so Wylan has a happy ending. Jesper has a happy ending. His father goes away, not goes away, but his father is going back to Novi Zem to their farm. And he's like, Jesper, I hope you do come visit me. And Jesper is going to stay with Wylan to get him set up with the house and everything. Nina doesn't have as happy of an ending. She is going to go to Firda to bury Matthias's body. They go off in a pretend death boat because the plague warning is still there. And they're going to meet up with the Ravkin people so that they can get everyone out. And also Kue is gonna go as well. I forgot about that. They have a very sad funeral, even though their motto is no mourners, no funerals, but I guess Matthias is the exception. I think a couple weeks later, or a week or so later, I'm not sure how long it's been, Kaz is thriving as well as he can be thriving. He's the new full leader of the Crows. His businesses are doing well. Pekka Rollins' businesses are not doing well. And Inej has been staying with Jesper and Wylan in Wylan's house. And when he goes to visit Inej, that real Council of Tides shows up. I should mention that the previous Council of Tides that showed up at the auction, they were just the Grisha that were left in the city. They used them to make a bluff and it worked because Kaz figured the Council of Tides never shows up normally. Why would they show up now? And he was right. But they do show up on Kaz's walk to be like, we want Kue Yolbo. Kaz maintains that he's dead and they're like, don't lie to us. One of them starts drowning him and Kaz ends up threatening them with the plague, which he's also bluffing because Nina did that and also it's not a real plague. He says, I'll spread sickness around every one of your towers. They'll become epicenters of disease. You think the merchant council won't lock you all down? Demand you finally register your identities? They'd probably be happy for the excuse. They call him a monstrous boy. And he says, Ketterdam is made of monsters. I just happen to have the longest teeth. We won't forget this, Kaz Brecker. One day you'll regret your insolence. And Kaz says, tell you what, when that day comes, mark it on your calendars. I can think of a lot of people who will want to throw a party. And then they disappear. Oh, I forgot. Oh my God, the most important part. I forgot about it. I'm so sorry, I'm so frazzled. The most important part, they do get their money. Kaz skimmed a bit off the top of what they deposited in the shoes account. And so they each get their four million Krug and they're all rich people now. And so partially with his money, Kaz decided to buy Inez a ship because she wants to become 
a sailor, a pirate, to stop slavers and save the people who need her help, basically. And Kaz also offers her a crew, or help with finding a crew. And the ship is also named the Wraith. And the last thing that Kaz does for her is he had Stormhund, also known as King Nikolai, which he reveals to Kaz during his meeting because Kaz is like, there's no way the King of Ravka is sending a privateer to do business for his country. Also the meaning of using Stormhund, sorry, I'm distracted again, but allegedly the reason he sent Stormhund is because Ravka can't be seen bidding on this and having the potential to lose. It would be very embarrassing, but everyone knows that Stormhund is representing Ravka and that he has King Nikolai's approval, so it doesn't really make sense, that whole thing. It's nice as an Easter egg because if you've watched any of my Shadow and Bone vlogs, you know that I love Nikolai so much with all my heart, but it doesn't really make sense with the context of the story, but I still loved it anyway. <laughs> So as a favor, Stormhund ended up looking or sending out people to find Inej's parents and they ended up on a ship and she sees them in the telescope thing and she goes to meet her parents and it's lovely and great and everyone gets a happy ending except for Nina and also Matthias. Um, and I loved it. And the last last chapter involves Pekka Rollins and Pekka has been in the countryside with his son, enjoying his time with his son and he has a plan to go back to Ketterdam and revive his businesses until someone shows up in his house while he's in bed. Can you guess? It's the Wraith, also known as Inej. And she cuts his chest and is like, don't you ever show your face in Ketterdam again. And this scares the bejesus out of Pekka Rollins. And also Inej silently switches out the Dime Lions toy that his son had and puts in a crow. And so Pekka's like, we're getting out of the country we're going away forever and that's the end of the story i'm just now realizing there's a whole cast of characters thing back here and it has pronunciations so that's good to know i guess have i been saying someone's name wrong this entire time let's find out well it's too late now because i'm done now overall i'm keeping my rating at five stars because i just get so emotional okay like i love all of the characters even matthias I just, I couldn't imagine not giving this five stars. My favorite characters, if you couldn't already tell, were Jesper and Marlin because they were just both such sweetie pies and I love them both. I don't love Kaz as much as everyone else does. He's just, I don't know, there's nothing wrong with him. But I really do enjoy all of the characters so much. I feel like because this book gives us so much room for all of their backstories and everything, like you really feel like you know them, you really get to love them and just appreciate all of them so much and yeah i'm so glad i did this reread thank you so much for watching if you like this video please be sure to give it a thumbs up in the comments down below leave me a crow emoji if there's a crow emoji or any kind of bird emoji uh, let me know any thoughts you have had about the six of crows duology i will have linked down below my shadow and bone trilogy playlist if you're interested and i also will have a king of scars video out in the near future subscribe to my channel if you haven't already do all the things YouTubers ask you to do. I will see you in my next video. Goodbye.